is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Fang. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for week number three, including a detailed breakdown of the Chiefs versus the Ravens. We're talking with Teddy Savransky of Wager Talk, Sports Memo, and Covers to get his thoughts on week three's games. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang of ThePowerRank.com. Ed, you're all masked up. What's go- what's going on here? The Bundesliga is back. Had oh, already? Dort- yeah. The Bundesliga is back. I had to wear my Dortmund mask. Uh, Dortmund had a pretty impressive 3-0 win over Mönchengladbach. And uh, more importantly, uh, Gio Reyna, the young American, 17 years old, uh, scored his first goal. Okay. And actually got fouled that uh, game in penalty kick that led to the, the second goal. So, uh, win-win. Uh and uh, it, it's a soccer club. Like, they, they call it the beautiful game. And if you yeah. really want to understand why, like, flip on ESPN Plus in a Dortmund game, and, and you'll see why it's the beautiful game. But how are you going to keep up with Bundesliga once we have SEC football this weekend? We have the NFL now. We're going to have Big Ten yeah. next month. Like, how are you going to keep up with everything all at once? I mean, I try to catch up with a little bit of it live. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, without any Big Ten football so far, it's been – you know, a lot of my attention has been on NFL and I've actually been, you know, going to a sports bar for the one o'clock games. And, yeah. and, uh, I've actually really never done that consistently. Yeah. And it's been, a, you know, I mean, it's kind of like March madness every week, you know, and when, when you get that last half hour yeah. and like a bunch of your results, ATS are changing <laughs> yeah. as you go. Uh, yeah. So that's been fun. So how am I going to keep it all? I don't know. I mean, I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to put on replays while I eat lunch during the week, I guess, right. of, of, of Dortmund. Right. Nice. I like it. Yeah. Well, it's going to be the good thing this weekend is that the big game of the week is on Monday night. So you don't need to have any divided attention. You can just focus on Chiefs versus Ravens. And this game is going to be awesome. Uh, we've yeah. seen the Ravens live up to the preseason expectations so far because their yep. defense, uh, their rebuilt defense, uh, like, I guess – like rebuilt is usually used in a negative term. Like the Vikings defense is rebuilt, but like they didn't add in guys like Calais Campbell uh, as part of their rebuilding. And like the, these two teams had all this hype coming into the year. We were talking about how much uncertainty there was, but like we thought they'd be good. They've been even better than that. So this game is going to be really fun. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I don't know who doesn't have these as the top two teams in the NFL right now. Uh, Yeah. I think you'd be a little insane not to. And, yeah, it should be fantastic. And uh, the only thing that adds to that, Jim, is that uh, my nine-year-old has become a Chiefs fan. Good. Because he likes to root for KFC. <laughs> so I might try to give him, like, a, like I don't know, like a KFC with a little arrowhead. And, and he's like, yeah, I'll watch, the, I'll watch KFC with you Monday night. <laughs> See, my thought process was because it's you – I thought he was like, oh, yeah, Andy Reid throws a lot in early downs. That's why exactly. I want to back the Chiefs. Because I just have, like, like because I, I know you, I assume that your kids think exactly like you. And I was like, oh, okay, he's just an Andy Reid guy. It was, well, But it was actually KFC. Well, remember, this is the same nine-year-old that was like, oh, Marcus Smart just hit five threes in a row. He must be the best three-point shooter in the league. And he was ignoring the fact that he was below average right. shooting three-pointers. So I mean, we're working on him. Yeah, this, exactly. This, I'll send, the, I'll send him the I'll send him the charts of really down pass rates from Sharp Football, and uh, we'll we'll get him to be even even deeper ingrained in being a Chiefs fan. I think that uh, that could yeah. only end well. We're gonna break down that game with Teddy Savransky. You can find him on Twitter at Teddy underscore Covers. You can find his work everywhere. Uh, he's at Wager Talk, Sports Memo, Covers. You can find Teddy all those places to get his thoughts and find all of his picks for the NFL. We're talking about his success rate uh, when it comes to that later on. We're also going to preview week three, talk about Teddy's process uh, with regards to betting because it's nice to have guys like Teddy on, Ed, because we think one way and it's good to find people who think other ways. And Teddy, we talked about this last year pretty extensively when we were talking with him uh, before the season about how Teddy likes to go against data because data is so so much influencing spreads. If you're going to find an edge, you've got to find a ways to find things that data doesn't enca- encapsulate. So I find talking to guys like Teddy to be really valuable for me personally. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's not like Teddy doesn't understand math or anything. Oh, no. I mean, he I'm... said that he his, his origins were in data stuff, but then once yeah. the spread started to account for it, he had to find a new way. Yeah, yeah. So he, you know, he chooses to kind of go out and, and dig information wherever he can find it, and he, and uh, that's that's found an edge for him. And so that's great. Um, but it, it's not like he doesn't get it, right? It, no, It's no. just that he chooses to find an edge elsewhere. And the other thing, too, is data can also be information. Like every every piece of news that you read is also data, just different kind of data. And I think that, that right. uh, it's another way to look at it. So we're going to talk to Teddy in just a second here to preview week number three. But first, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We have this NFL podcast every week and might be adding in some college football once again, not too far down the line. So to get a notification once our podcasts go up each and every week, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread and... If you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Now, before we get to Teddy, we got to go back to week number two. Pretty exciting week. Uh, a lot of tight games and a lot of tight spreads. We're going to go back through what we saw in week number two and then dive into week number three. Covering the past. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Edward Egros on to preview week number two, and Edward had himself a nice little week. You can find Edward on Twitter at EdWithSports. He wanted the Ravens minus seven in their matchup with the Texans, and that line closed seven and a half to get some uh, a half point of value there, and the Ravens covered that one pretty easily. Edward was on the Cowboys as four and a half point favorites against the Falcons. Now, we recorded that Wednesday. Tyron Smith got hurt on Thursday, uh, so that one did close at the Cowboys by three. The Smith injury likely played a role in the movement and also in the fact that the Cowboys had to scramble to come back. They lost three fumbles in like the first quarter, but they did claw back to get the win, just did not cover in that spot. Uh, The Tyron Smith injury, bad timing there for sure. Both Edward and I had action on the Rams-Eagles. Edward had the Rams minus two and a half, or he bought the Rams at two and a half. I wanted the over on 47. Now, Edward uh, did buy the points with the Rams, Rams minus 2.5. And and unfortunately, we both got bad line movement there because the Eagles closed as two-point favorites. The total closed at 46, but both got wins there despite the, the bad line movement. The over hit in this one pretty easily. Finished at 56, even though Carson Wentz, uh, the, the pick report, threw a pick in the end zone. Uh, the Rams won by 18. So Edward and I both got wins there, and the pick report gets a win with Carson Wentz as well. The final one was the Seahawks at the Patriots, or Seahawks against the Patriots, where the two of you went head-to-head. Edward was laying the points with Seattle. You had New England plus four, and it wound up coming down to the final play of the game, and Ed, you were a yard away from covering there because Cam Newton got stuffed uh, at the one yard line. I was pulling for you. Not that I, I, I want to root against Edward ever, obviously, but like <laughs> it was a fun game. Yeah. It was an awesome game and just no. a yard away. Uh, but that was, that was a good one there. I appreciate it. And, and it was definitely weird. It was on five points because uh, they had stuffed Cam on a two point conversion earlier right. in the game. So that was another opportunity where, you know, most likely new England covers if they just convert that two point conversion um, you know, we've obviously seen a lot from Seattle's offense, but you know, we've seen some just surprising things from New England's offense as well. Uh, you know, came through for 6.7 yards per pass attempt, uh, week one against Miami, 8.8, uh, against Seattle. Um, you know, a defense that, you know, a secondary that I thought was better, yeah. uh, when you had Jamal Adams, you, you look at the year that Griffin had last year, it was pretty decent in coverage. And then um, Quentin Dunbar actually had some pretty good PFF grades last year in Washington. So, so maybe a unit that will come back, but a unit that's not really looking good right now and suggests that, you know, maybe you want to go over on, on these Seattle games. Yeah. And Cam played really well Monday night or Sunday night. And like, I think watching them in week one, you could tell they'd be a fun offense, but like they didn't have to open it up with the passing game on Sunday. They did like they needed to keep up with Seattle and they had to throw. And when they did, like Cam was like hitting Julian Edelman downfield. I didn't know Edelman was allowed to go downfield anymore, but like (laughs) he hit him downfield. Uh, Despite the fact the receivers there, I don't think are good at all. Cam looked awesome. So I thought that was very interesting. I, I had my lingering skepticism after week one, I've pulled back on that for week number two. After what we saw week two from Cam as a passer, I agree that Seattle's, uh, I mean, I think Seattle's defense might not be good, uh, but Cam doing what he did in that spot was impressive to me. Even if their defense isn't that good, I was still impressed with that. But a fun game for sure. Absolutely. And Jim, uh, you you actually mentioned Rams minus two and a half uh, against the Eagles. I think it was Rams plus two and a half. 
Was it? Okay. Because the Eagles were favored at home. No, the, at, when we talked on Wednesday, it was actually Rams minus one and a half, and Edward bought it to two oh, and was a half. It? Yeah. Wait, and so it went all the way to Eagles? So it, it opened Eagles like minus two and a half. It went to Rams minus one and a half, and then it closed the Eagles minus two. It was It's the exact same thing. Right. Like, we're going to talk about uh, the, the Rams game this week uh, with the Bills. It's been the same thing there. So whatever right. reason, the Rams are just a very popular betting team this year on both sides. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And we're going to talk more about that, too. But that was yeah. one of the weirder movements I've seen in a while with that game. Yeah, and then and then we also got to talk about Carson Wentz real quick because yeah. yes. Okay, so wait, know. wait before before you talk, I need to give you kudos. Uh, I was listening to the Athletic Football Show today with Robert Mays, and they were breaking down uh, week number two. They were talking about Carson Wentz with one of the Eagles reporters for the Athletic, and they gave you the pick and the pick report a shout out on the air because you predicted Carson Wentz would throw more picks this year and voila Carson Wentz is throwing more picks so you're getting dap from the athletic you're getting dap from me uh <laughs> you, the, the pick report's looking pretty snazzy through two weeks yeah man thanks I, I definitely appreciate it uh it should be noted that I did not predict that Carson Wentz was going to become Jameis Winston <laughs> So Carson Wentz is at a 4.7 or 4.8% pick rate this year, which is famously what, what Winston had last year as, as the Tampa Bay quarterback. So um, he's kind of gone to the other side a little bit with his picks. Uh, I don't expect him to be near 5% for the season. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe he will. But, you know, yeah. they, they actually did talk in the podcast, uh, which I appreciate you're sending me. Uh, they talked about how, you know, it's not going to be that bad. And, and right. I don't think it's going to be that bad. Right. But um, – but, yeah, I do feel comfortable in saying, like, you know, Wentz was probably pretty lucky over a three-year stretch with picks. And we're seeing that come back a little bit, uh, four picks early this season. Um, and, you know, I was kind of against uh, the Eagles, you know, trying to trying to pick them against uh, on the side and things like that. But now maybe it's gone the other way. Yeah. Uh, and my numbers actually kind of like them uh, against uh, Cincy this week. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you know things things regress one way, they go back the other way, uh, and now and now I'm regression would predict that Carson Wentz is probably going to get better uh, yeah. in the interception department. So that that's how it goes with a small sample size of two games. It's weird how that works. It's weird how public sentiment works because like the sentiment on Wentz has been yo-yoing the exact same way. Like you talk to an Eagles fan one week, you know Carson Wentz is uh, ten time MVP. You talk to him next week, he should be benched for Jalen Hurts. You know, it just it depends on the way the wind blows. But um, right. they're a very interesting team for sure. But kudos to the pick report for being on top of that. Also, kudos to, uh, to Edward Egros for being 3-1 and one last week. Make sure you nice. follow Edward on Twitter at Ed with Sports. We're going to get to Teddy Savransky in just one second. But first, FanDuel is always giving users a chance at glory and a big payday. And the Ringers Mega Contest is the latest way they're giving you more ways to win. It is easy. Just make five picks against the spread, including one double down every week. The top 100 users at the end of the season will compete for $25,000 in prizes during the playoffs. The best part is it's free to enter. The first two weeks are already in the books, so what are you waiting for? To enter for free, visit playfree.fanduel.com slash the ringer. That's playfree.fanduel.com slash the ringer to get yourself entered. You can also go to the FanDuel lobby, uh, and it is up there. Eligibility restrictions apply. Let's dive into week number three now with Teddy Savransky. Follow Teddy on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. We're going to talk Chiefs Ravens. We're going to talk Cowboy Seahawks and get you all set for week number three. Covering the present. Let's bring Teddy Savransky into covering the spread. Teddy, we are heading into week number three of the NFL. How are you doing so far? I got no complaints. Uh, I got a couple. Of, you always have complaints. <laughs> I, I feel like I should have bet more. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the first couple of weeks of this season where there was no preseason, I was a little bit reluctant to bet every opinion I had. I wish I would have. Uh, because if you're digging for information right now, the information is giving you more of an edge than any opinions that you'll have about the teams. Uh, and, uh, if you've been, if you've been digging the, you know, the NFL has been good, uh, the first couple of weeks. And again, I made a profit. I just feel like I should have made more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not going to complain when you're winning, but there's been some really good opportunities the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I think there are this week as well, as well. I think the information discussion is important too, because, if it's harder for us to find information with no preseason games, it's harder for books to find information too. So as long as, like you're saying, you're doing the work, 
you can still have a really good edge and potentially even a better edge, potentially, because that information is harder to come by. So one of the advantages I have living in Vegas, and I do a bunch of shows, and I talk with bookmakers all week long, and literally, to a man, every bookmaker I've talked to here in Las Vegas, from the start of when the NFL was going to be announced through this week even, they're like, yeah, we're making adjustments on the fly. We don't know a whole lot more than you do. Um, and I like to hear that lack of confidence sure. from the other side of the counter. Sure. You know, and, and I like to hear that bookmaker. And again, you don't want it too bad that a book closed. But I like that the, the betters won last week. They kicked the books, you know, up and down the card. The betters won last week. Maybe not Monday Night Football with the, uh, the Raiders upset. But by and large. It was a good week for betters and a rough week for bookmakers. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the only one we see like that. Uh, because the bookmaker, the edge of the bookmakers is only the minus 110 right now. It's not like they've got info that we don't have. Um, right. It's not like they, they we're all playing on an even playing field here in, in that regard. So, Teddy, you talked about that uh, lack of information for the bookmakers for the NFL. Do you feel like that's the same in college? And, and how's that been for you? The college has been real good <laughs> because, if you, again, if you're digging in college football, you have to dig. All right. The student newspapers have been real good. All right. And normally I, I don't I don't do a nice. lot with student newspapers. But when it comes to COVID info that you're not finding out in mainstream media, you know, the Daily Sooner broke the story on the Oklahoma uh, COVID outbreak. I mean, the, it, the information is there. And it's, it's people say, how do you do it? It's real simple. Google News is a powerful tool. OK, you, know, you type in one team name and the opposing coach name and you see what comes up. You type the other coach's name and the other team name and you see what comes up. And if you sit and read through the articles and take the time and don't, you know, I'm not a quant based capper. I'm not a stat based capper. And that's why I like doing this show with you, because I know you guys take a different approach right. in a lot of regards to that. I'm an information guy. I'm a local news guy. I'm a current form guy. And in college football, most assuredly. That's what, matter, that's what matters the most right now uh, in NCAA. Yeah. It's nothing to do with how good you th thought the teams were going to be or what their statistical profile looks like. It's about information on what teams are healthy, what teams are focused, what teams have distractions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's been paying off very well through the first three weeks of the season. That's very interesting. And you were talking about the student newspapers, and I think that's, uh, I mean, as a supporter of student newspapers, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad they're they are paying off for you for sure. So we've got two weeks in the books here, Teddy, and like you said, you, you had some priors coming in, and you wished you had reacted more to those. Uh, what are some league-wide things you've seen so far that, that may have altered any priors or even confirmed priors you had coming in so far? So are we, are we talking lead wide or, or yeah, league specific? wide? Yeah, what do you see? Lead wide, so there's only one thing that stands out. Uh, two things that stands out. One is there's not much of a home field edge, and we're still debating how much the home field is worth. Um, you know, bookmaker by bookmaker, better by better, everyone's got a different number. I'm trying to make different numbers for different teams, but my adjustments are modest. You know, I'm moving a half point here, a half point there. Uh, but the home field is no sure thing, and we're still learning about how much that is worth. And of course, scoring's way up, and I mean way up. Uh, which is not what we expected coming into the season. Normally, the first two weeks, we see the defenses ahead of the offenses. Uh, and with the lack of preseason, we thought that would even be more of the case this year. And it's not. The offense have come out clicking. The quarterback play has been there. And I think that's the hidden part of that equation. Right now, you're an NFL GM. There's 32 teams. Who needs a quarterback? Denver needs one. That's about it. I mean, after yeah, it's like nobody. Yeah, Denver right. only needs one because their QB got hurt. Right. So we're not seeing the, the dismal QB play right. that you often see uh, from some teams. There hasn't been one team uh, that's been that you're like, oh my god, they have no quarterback whatsoever. The, you know, we've got 30, 31 starting quarterbacks, <laughs> and, and then whatever the Broncos are going to do. I was going to uh, Denver in one of my notes is a team that uh, I've made big power rating adjustments to, obviously since the start of the season, but. Part of that increase in scoring is just, in general, we're not seeing bottom feeder offenses. Um, that's at least a piece of the equation, and, and that's <laughs> different this year, certainly, than in years past. Yeah, we'll see how that evolves. Uh, J.J. Zacharyson definitely came on before week one and, and talked about how the last time there was no preseason, there was a bump in scoring for the first couple of weeks. So we've certainly seen that so far. And, um, yeah, be interested to see what happens going forward. Teddy, how about like team specific adjustments? Like who's moving off your preseason prior the most? Uh, what can you tell us about that? All right, so uh, I wrote down a handful of teams that I've moved significantly. Uh, biggest non-injury downgrades 
are pretty easy. You know, the Vikings are at the top of my list. <laughs> right. Like yeah. Team that, you know, and I, I'm kicking myself uh, for not betting Minnesota under their season win total. They were literally my last cut. And I'm like, you know, I just uh, I, I hate everyone in that division. And that was right. part of the reason why, I mean, I didn't like the Packers, didn't like the Lions, didn't like the Bears. I'm like, that was, and, and I left it on the cutting room floor. And after week two, there's not, I mean, it's not a lock, but it's, a, the Vikings <laughs> do, do not look like a good, and the injuries they've had. Obviously, you lose your best uh, pass rusher, or you lose your best linebacker. Um, Steph Diggs getting more receiving yards than the entire team last week. <laughs> you know, it, it's a Vikings team that, that deservedly has uh, that plummeted in my power ranking. So is Philadelphia, uh, another team. And, and with, the, with the Eagles, it's certainly injury related. Uh, on the other hand, Philly, you know, maybe it, maybe it's all. I, I, they were nine lined as a nine win team. Uh, I thought they would be right in that range, and the injury bug has certainly hit them hard. But the the issues with Philadelphia, I think, transcend just the transcend just the injuries. Um, and they've been a, a, a team that I've uh, plummeted my ratings. And of course, the Lions, who I weren't very high on to begin with. I know was, uh, here in Vegas, there was all this love for. Oh, Matthew Stafford. Oh, this is the year. And Detroit. Oh, my God. Look at this division. Detroit's going to win in the day in NFC West. And, um, you know, I'm like, this is a team that comes into the season with a nine game losing streak. And Matthew Stafford has never won anything anywhere. Um, so the Lions have been uh, an easy team for me to downgrade. Uh, injury wise, I mean, the, you talked about the Broncos uh, and it's certainly the 49. I don't think any team's been hit worse than the 49ers. Right. Uh, you know, San Fran went from a top five team in my initial preseason power rating to a below average team in my current power rating uh, based solely on injuries. Uh, and uh, Denver is a team that actually bet over their season win total at seven and a half. The day I bet it over was the day that Von Miller ruptured his uh, ACL. Oops. And since then, literally, I, it, there's been one injury after the next for that team. It's been a disaster. So uh, the Broncos, 2-0 and against the spread. Uh, but that over seven and a half win total looks uh, looks pretty dismal for me uh, right about now. So, so uh, can, we talk- oh. can I just stop you real quick? Because you talked a little bit about how Niners have gone from top five to, to league average. Uh, give us a sense. Like, I know you're not a numbers guy, but like, how do, how do you say Richard Sherman? He's so many points. Nick Bosa, he's so many points. Like, how, how do you do that? I, I don't do that. I do clusters. All right. Okay. They've got cluster injuries. I don't get one player is not worth anything. Nick Bosa's out. doesn't matter. When you got, th- I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not going to break the, uh, have me all of a sudden downgrade the 49ers four points. But when you have cluster injuries like San Fran does, they have cluster injuries on the offensive line, on the defensive line, in the secondary. And obviously they're without, a, they may be without their quarterback this week. Uh, but, uh, and wide receivers, they have cluster injury receiver as well. Garoppolo, doesn't know whether it's Garoppolo or not, uh, there aren't weapons to throw to. So cluster injuries, to me, are the much bigger factor than any one individual star sitting a game. Uh, when you have three or four guys out of a unit, it makes a huge difference. And San Fran is the three or four guys out of three or four different units, uh, hence uh, the downgrade week by week. I think that's interesting, too, with the Eagles because it's kind of a cluster along their offensive line. You had Andre Diller go down. You had Brandon Brooks go down before the season. And, you know, Lane Johnson missed week's num- week number one. Isaac Sayamalu is now banged up for them as well. Are they going to fall in the same category or as the 49ers, or are you just off them even once they start to return to health? Uh, so let's see Philly play a good game before we start upgrading the Eagles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, they've been, Doug Peterson got a lot of credit for everything that Frank Reich did to win that Super Bowl. <laughs> you know? Um, okay. And uh, let's see what adjustments Peterson makes. He has not impressed me last year or this in his ability to make week to week adjustments or in game adjustments. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not in any rush to, to start up in my Eagles powering. Let's see him. Let's see him beat Cincy this week before we get excited about Philadelphia. I think yeah, that is interesting. Very fair. two weeks in a row that a team has had a must win game against uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, <laughs> which is which I find somewhat comical. Teddy would love to ask you about some games in particular uh, Texans at the Steelers. Texans are 0 and 2. A uh, four-point dog in this game uh, with a four with a total of 44 and a half. Um, of course, the Texans have played a tough schedule. Uh, what are you thinking about this game? They haven't played a tough schedule. They played an impossible schedule, uh, and it, it doesn't get a whole lot less impossible this week. But you know, I mean, uh, I don't know about you guys. I've got both Kansas City and Baltimore uh, more than four points ahead of my number three team. Uh, in okay. the NFL, so to play those two teams week one, it's I mean, it doesn't get any tougher. And then the Texans did not uh, fare well. No surprise at all uh, with the uh, Houston's 
uh, early struggles, but it doesn't get a whole lot easier here. This is where you do want to do some database research. And the database research shows very clearly that the 0-2 teams are bet on in week three. Uh, the 0-2 teams, when they face an opponent with a win, at least one win, uh, they've been, you know, again, you look at a five-year sample size, a 10-year sample size, you're seeing well over 60% covers uh, for these 0-2 teams. I think the 10-year sample size is at 67% or 66. It's been uh, pretty good. Uh, so knowing that uh, with the database history and knowing that the Texans have been up against the toughest of competition, I can only look at the Houston side in this ballgame. Okay, and the Steelers, again, we saw last week, not that what we saw week one was a mirage, because I do think the Steelers' defense is better than what we saw uh, against Denver. But then again, anytime you take out the starting quarterback who the defense has prepped for all week and then put in the backup QB who the defense has not prepped for and not watched film for and is not familiar with their tendencies, you'll oftentimes see a spark. And that's how you know, I think the Nuggets spark in the second half last week uh, with Jeff Driscoll is not an indictment of the Steelers' defense. I am absolutely a believer that Pittsburgh will continue uh, to give teams trouble uh, with uh, on the defensive side of the football. That is an elite uh, stop unit. But, <laughs> number one, we like Deshaun Watson catching points. Number two, we like a desperate Deshaun Watson catching points. Number three, I don't, I'm not sold on the Steelers offensively yet at all. All right, their playmakers have been making plays, and I'll give them credit. Um, you know, Claypool had, you know, the big touchdown last week. Dante Johnson's been making plays. I mean, but, when you watch Big Ben, and his comment last week uh, really stood out to me. He's like, yeah, I feel like I got hit by a truck. I'm hoping tomorrow it only gets, it feels like I got hit by a car. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, Big Ben doesn't have the mobility that he did. His game plan now is similar. He reminds me of Ryan Fitzpatrick. The way, the way, he, the way he's chuck, you know, he chucks the ball up and lets his receiver make plays. Um, there's vulnerability in an offense like that. Rossberger used to be the most accurate guy. He's not doing that now. Now it's about, if you watch the velocity of his throws, he's throwing air, you know, he's chucking them up and letting it for all the big plays for, uh, for Pittsburgh have, have come with that strategy. Um, so I'm not sold on Big Ben being back. Pittsburgh's got issues on the offensive line right now. It's a must win desperation spot for the Texans. And the 0-2 teams have shown uh, a propensity in your D-base research to be bet on. So the only way I can look to here is Houston. That said, have I gotten to the window with it? No. Uh, is it, has the line already moved against me? You know, against it? Yes. <laughs> the wise guys all over it? Yes. Um, so it's not anything in my pocket. Uh, I think Pittsburgh's yeah. a good notch or two better than the Texans. And I'm not in a rush to bet on Houston just because they're 0-2 and, and desperate. They're 0-2. Because they're not that good. And we've seen some clear weaknesses in this team compared to last year, even against the upper echelon competition. So, uh, bottom line, lean Houston. Uh, haven't bet it and probably won't. All right, let's move on here to the Cowboys at the Seahawks. Really fun game on uh, Sunday afternoon. Seahawks, five-point favorites here. The total is 55-and-a-half, which is massive. And the Seahawks are a team that are changing things up. You know, they're throwing more often early downs, early in games, which is not something they've done in the past. But... Unfortunately, it seems like the market has, uh, is accounting for that pretty fully here. Do you think the market is overreacted with this total being a 55 and a half? Or is that around where you would put it, given what you've seen out of Seattle the first two weeks? Yeah, I don't know the market adjusted enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so where you find the real quote unquote value on totals is, is on the margins. You know, when a game's lined at 39 and a half, Maybe it should be lined at 33 and a half, but the market doesn't go to 33 and a half. When a game's lined at 55 and a half, maybe it should be a 60.5, but the market doesn't go to 60.5. On right. the margins, where you're getting, and make no mistake about it, all right? Seahawks defense, yardage wise, is the worst in the NFL. Yards per play wise has been a little bit better than that. Dallas defense, I think they're 26th in yards per game allowed. They're a little bit better yards per play. But neither defense is trustworthy in the slightest, all right? And, oh, we'll see adjustments. Yeah, maybe we'll see adjustments. Seattle has no pass rush. Dallas has no pass rush. You know, when teams aren't getting sacks and don't have a pass rush, opposing quarterbacks who are good are going to be able to take advantage of that. And these are two opposing quarterbacks who are really good, two teams that are very willing to chuck the football around, 
early in the game and often in the game. Two teams that are very comfortable playing in a shootout style. So you say, oh, the market's overreacting? No, the markets aren't overreacting. And you're not going to catch me betting under on this game. You know, <laughs> um, it's over a pass. Okay, I like it. Uh, what about the spread here? The Cowboys have a little bit of that cluster injury thing along the offensive line. Sounds like Tyron Smith might be back this week, though, which would definitely help things. And as you said, the Seattle pass rush is nothing to write home about. So uh, any read on the spread for you with Seattle minus five? Uh, sure. I mean, if I'm playing, I can only take Dallas plus. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, you talk about simple NFL rules that make sense and make money. Don't lay more than a field goal with teams that don't play defense. You know, uh, and that's and so it's you know a priori. I want no part of uh, Seattle in this price range. Seattle was, uh, how should we say it, fortuitous to uh, to get the point spread cover last week, and they made a great play at the goal line. We give them credit for that, but uh, it wasn't like the Seahawks defense dominated against a you know a team that is in complete rebuild mode in a lot of ways offensively. You know, when you talk about what the Patriots are doing with Cam Newton uh, and a new offensive line coach and a new skill position talent around. I mean, it's uh, there's been an enormous amount of change, and Seattle didn't shut them down. Uh, I'm not convinced that they shut Dallas down either. Uh, so uh, it'd be Cowboys slash over if I'm going to get involved in that game. Excellent. So uh, we talked about these two best teams in the NFL, which you have four points better than uh, anyone else. Kansas City is at Baltimore Monday night. Uh, Ravens, uh, Jim tells me, is a three-point favorite. You know, though I think I saw a two and a half earlier. Uh, total at 53 and a half. Um, you know, everyone's going to be watching. What, what are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, and I mean, this number's moved. You know, it moved from two and a half up to three and a half, right? Basically uh, at the get go. And I'm seeing mostly three and a halves uh, okay. on my live odd screen right now. So, um, the, and I agree with the move. Okay. This isn't just a game for Baltimore, it's not even just a Monday night football game. This is a statement game for the Ravens on national TV, on Monday night football, and I think they're going to put on a show. You know, Baltimore wasn't in the Super Bowl last year. They got the defending Super Bowl champs coming to their building, and obviously we look at Kansas City, and I'm I'm disappointed by the disparate result last week where we saw, and again, Baltimore kills these non-division foes, and KC had a tough division opponent and a tough game. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the markets reacted a lot to that. Uh, so we're looking at three and a half now instead of two and a half. That being said, it's warranted. <laughs> All right. This isn't a knee jerk move. This is a much bigger game for the home team than it is for the road team. I know KC catching points sounds attractive and KC, uh, you know, with T- Tavon Young, the injury for uh, the Ravens, that's a meaningful injury in a game like this. Uh, where you lose your slot cornerback uh, for Baltimore. I understand all those factors. And Patrick Mahomes is not a QB I'm ever in a rush to bet against. But, one, I believe Baltimore is every bit as good as Kansas City. And, two, I believe this game is a play like your hair's on fire game for the Ravens. And I don't get that sense from KC. KC had this tough barn burner of a game last week in a divisional matchup. They got to fly across country and bring it again on Monday night. Uh, I like the Ravens. I could only like the Ravens. And uh, I'm, I continue to believe in Jim Harbaugh, as long as it's not a playoff statement game. Regular season <laughs> statement game. You know, playoff game, you like him catching points on the road. Harbaugh's great. And you don't want to lay points to them at home. Um, hey, Teddy, you got, the, you got the wrong Harbaugh. It's John Harbaugh. Yeah. Oh, did I say Jim? <laughs> yeah. It's all right, man. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my apologies. It's uh, Big I, I, I know that there's two Harbaugh. Yeah, I know brothers. you're thinking about that Michigan and coming back on October 24th. So, so we we'll, 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 we'll understand that. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. You know, Kansas City is built around that offense. Uh, the defense has never been, uh, I guess, a priority for for Andy Reid and that team. Uh, still have doubts about the secondary, and they haven't looked good. Um, in some of my success rate numbers. So, uh, and and Baltimore, you know, is built pretty strong from the secondary. So we'll. Um, We'll see what happens in that that Monday night game. Yeah, if I'm playing, I'm laying on Monday night. And uh, it's still at minus three at FanDuel Sportsbook. If if you can find a three, would you take that? Yes, I would do that this minute. All right, perfect. Any other bets stand out to you on the board at week uh, for week number three right now, Teddy? Well, yeah, we got we got to talk about this Rams Bills game. With I mean, it's still sitting two and a half at you know you you had two or two and a half at uh, 
I thought I saw one and a half there. Uh, it was one and a half earlier today, and right now it is two and a half. So it did move. Uh, it is two and a half uh, bills by two and a half. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we've seen. Kind of two-way action on that game so far. There was an initial move towards L.A. Now we're seeing a little bit of buyback uh, on the Buffalo side. Um, I hate this spot for the Rams. Hate it. All right. Again, they were planning on staying east. All right. Back-to-back East Coast games. The original plan was they're going to stay east. The 49ers figured out how to do it. L.A. didn't. They're flying and flying back and flying back and flying back. And I know they've been really good in these early start road games. They've what covered their last seven in this role. Okay. That's all rearview mirror. Okay. What have we seen from the Rams over the first two weeks? Well, we saw them take advantage of a Dallas team that hasn't covered a spread. We saw them take advantage of a Philadelphia team that hasn't covered a spread. And everyone's like, I've, had, I've seen Rams in people's top five power ratings right now. It's like, what are you watching? You know? <laughs> um, Buffalo's in my top five power ratings. All right. Nothing I've seen out of the Bills so far has changed my opinion about them whatsoever. I think they're actually better than I thought they were going to be. Offensively, Josh Allen, again, there are people that don't like Josh Allen because he's not the most accurate QB, and he misses throws. He does. But Josh Allen stretches the field on every play. Josh Allen's capable of chucking it 50 yards downfield, and the Bills are keeping opposing defenses honest by taking deep shots and connecting on those. And Josh Allen is a beast as a runner. You know, he's a Dante Culpepper when he tries to run the foot. I mean, it's really hard to bring him down, and he's getting big chunks of yards in every game moving on the ground. So offensively, I'm a believer in this Bills squad. And defensively, no, they didn't have a good game in Miami last week. You know, uh, it really wasn't, uh, you know. um, That said, I don't look at that game as the, oh, my God, the Bills defense is terrible. You know, they're they're in the heat and humidity. There was a long thunderstorm delay. And Fitz threw a bunch of passes that, you know, maybe they get picked and maybe the guy catches it and the guy caught a bunch of them. You know, Uh, that's what the Miami offense does. L.A.'s offense doesn't do that. All right. Goff is not chucking balls up. Uh, And, and of course, Goff last week had probably the best road game of his career. What he completed, his first 13 passes. Every quote after the game was how good. He's like, I felt good today right from the get-go. Not Oh, I'm this kind of quarterback forever, <laughs> you know. Uh, and Goff off a good game on the road. I don't, I don't trust it twice. I like the Bills' defense to make a statement. I think Buffalo wins this one going away. I think it's the single weakest point spread on the board this week. And I think that it's interesting so, too to look at this Bills team because actually, uh, going back, I, I think the Dante Culpepper comparison is awesome because like we always hear Cam Newton. I he, I see a lot of Cam and Josh Allen, but Dante Culpepper, like from a deep ball perspective, I can see that. Like I think that's that's not what I've heard. But I like that one a lot. That's fun. Yeah, it, it just, I mean, it, that's the skill set that he reminds me of. Because Culpepper, I mean, I, Allen, he made me crazy last week. He missed a couple of easy third down throws, you know. And he'll do that. His accuracy is not perfect. And it ended up, like, the, the, him missing one or two of those throws ended up being the difference between covering and not covering. And besides the, you know, the, the late uh, TD, you know, and the Bills outgained. And again, the Bills didn't cover. They gained 8.9 yards per play and outgained uh, the Dolphins by 3.2 yards per play. And again, you go back and look at a 20-year sample size, and teams in that role, they're 11, uh, they cover 11 out of 12, I think it was. You know, it was like, so even though Buffalo didn't do that and doesn't have the betting bandwagon because of that, the statistical profile says this team was supposed to cover last week, they're supposed to cover week one, and they're a freaking juggernaut. So I'm a Bills believer, Ed, you're not. I'm not. I do not believe in Josh Allen. The game, the NFL game is all about getting those passes, moving the chains. Uh, we know that explosive plays tend to be pretty random. And you know what? I like what they've done with the wide receiver, bringing in stuff on digs. Definitely get that. I know the kid makes plays uh, with his legs. Definitely give you that. But he is not a guy that is going to lead a team consistently to the playoffs year after year. And um, I'm not a believer in Josh Allen. I've been amazed by what I've seen given what I saw with him uh, sometimes in college. Actually, you know, he was pretty good his junior year. His stock went up. was was awful his senior year. Um, if you remember yeah. that senior year, they, they graduated four offensive linemen. You remember right. that, right? That, yeah, but that doesn't mean you throw you, – you consistently throw the ball at your receiver's ankles. <laughs> sometimes it does. 
So maybe, maybe it does. You know, I've never played. I've never played quarterback at that level. So maybe maybe that does mean you throw you throw at your receivers' ankles. But it, it does um, help though that Stephon Diggs can catch that ball at the ankles. That helps a lot. <laughs> Which is why, like, I mean, I feel like they've. You know, I mean, Buffalo's a really interesting team to me, right? Because, like, they've, they've done everything they can do to put around, you know, a quarterback that is never going to be that accurate. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I guess it's a little bit like Wentz, too, right? Because you have a guy who's an athlete, not the most accurate quarterback. I mean, I, I anyways, I'm speaking off the cuff now, but, you know, you have a good defense. I think the Bills defense, like, probably is going to grade out slightly better than the Rams defense by the time the season is over. But I mean, I think these two teams are evenly matched. But like, I'm 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 taking Sean McVay and, and Jared Goff over over Josh Allen any day. Um, I think this should be a tight game. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely uh, not a believer in Josh Allen. Right, so you'll take so uh, moving forward, you'll take Goff over Allen because I'll, I'll I'll put I'll take jo- I'll take Goff and McVay over Allen. All right, I, 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 I want Goff or I I, I, I want McVay because I'm I'm pretty sure the Rams are going to get rid of Goff sooner or later. Uh, you know. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, they they signed him to a pretty big deal, so I yes. don't know how much that was guaranteed, but it was a lot of I guaranteed mean, money. <laughs> so yeah. Golf is a top five quarterback by any stretch. I think he's somewhere in that like he's in the Kirk Cousins zone where he can do well if he has good things around him, and he can do poorly if he doesn't have that. And like the, I, when I say that he's in the Cousins zone, that's true of every quarterback except for like four, like Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, maybe, maybe, maybe Dak, but we haven't seen Dak in a bad situation. So Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. I mean, maybe Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. I think that's a fair inclusion too. Like it's not a big list of guys who are not dependent on their situation. Though Kirk cousins. I mean, I don't put golf. Golf is a lot better than Kirk cousins. Right. Okay. Kirk I think Cousins that Goff's is, ceiling in a good with a good offense around him is better than Kirk Cousins, but I think they're kind of in that blob, where which is where I put most quarterbacks, where they go as their situation goes. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that, but yeah. uh, Cousins, you but, know, what's but, his record against teams with a, a, a winning record? It's like seven and twenty nine, and or something like that. Goff's it ain't better. Great. Than that. <laughs> but but when Cousins had all the pieces, whatever that year was in Washington, like that pass offense was better than anything we've seen from Goff and McVay. Goff was top five in uh, 2018 in yeah. expected points per drop back. So I, don't and know. I, I remember them. T- Goff got his team to the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I don't seem to remember Cousins ever doing that. And I don't yeah, even remember. Well, the and I also cool. remember the Washington football team saying, should we pay this guy or should we let him go? Not that their organization's good. Fair. But uh, <laughs> they made the decision. Uh, well, uh, we've seen him. We know him. And we don't want him. And after his contract is done in Minnesota, the Vikings are going to make that same decision. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but the, I'm not sure the Washington I can't football team Goff is better off. Cousins is a bottom tier NFL quarterback. The Vikings. Goff, Vikings level. fans are, are very loud in taking for Trevor at this point already, which is which is shocking after two games. But they are they are very vocal about it. I will say uh, <laughs> for sure. That is Teddy Savransky. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. Uh, Teddy, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Good luck to you in week three and with your college stuff this week. Hey, thanks so much. I'll take all the luck I can get. Best of luck to you. Enjoy the games, and uh, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks, Teddy. Tell, tell everyone real quick about your NFL record since yeah the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, so uh, dating back to week one, 2015, I'm 57% in the NFL. I know I have 57% so far this season, so remarkably consistent. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, uh, so what, and that counts every play, regular season and playoffs. There's no, uh, I took out this or I took out. I, it doesn't count preseason. Uh, okay. But nobody, there was no preseason. And that's here. that's like won. a couple hundred games or? Uh, uh, I got the numbers right here if you want me to pull them up real quick. I thought you had them there. I did. I, oh, I closed I, the site. <laughs> just, you know, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're, a, di- we're, a, we're a math type uh, podcast. So we want to. Sure, sure, sure. I, I don't want to give any, you know, I, I want to be very accurate with anything I do because I know you guys. If I if I'm not, uh, I'm gonna take heat. Uh, so uh, of course it's not. Give me this. Sorry, I apologize. No worries. No, one, sorry. I put you on the spot. Uh, I've got 192 and 146. Okay. Uh, that counts so every play right hundred games. playoffs since the start of uh, of uh, the 2000 uh, week one of 2015. Uh, I had a bad year in 2014, and I was pissed off about it and i'm like uh, the next year uh i came with a little bit of a motive perhaps a little extra motivation and i tweaked some things and since then it's been real good 
The angry Teddy narrative. I like this. This is good. All right. Well, Thank you, Teddy, so much. Let's Hopefully that number goes up in week number three. I'll take it. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Best of luck. Thank you. You too. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Teddy Severansky for joining us here today to preview week number three. Again, follow Teddy on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. Make sure you check out his work, whether it be at Wager Talk, Sports Memo, or Covers. Just check out Teddy. Find all that at Teddy underscore covers. It was a fun discussion about debating Jared Goff versus Josh Allen because I understand the arguments on both sides. And, like, I have been a I, – I pick – I will pick Jared Goff. I want to be totally clear in that. I'm a huge Jared Goff guy. But – I am way more open to the idea of Josh Allen now because I put a lot of value in teams telling us what they think. And the Bills are telling me that they have a lot of faith in Josh Allen right now because their early down pass rate is shot through the roof. Like they are being very aggressive on early downs this year. And that to me says they have confidence in Josh Allen. That is not confidence Wyoming had in Josh Allen his senior year. Like, their early down pass rate in Wyoming his final year, they ran a lot early downs. And, like, if you have an elite quarterback, you would think they would air it out. They didn't there, but the Bills are. So I have been very resistant to buy into Josh Allen. I'm not going to buy into him because of games against the Jets and then against the Dolphins who lost Byron Jones in the middle of that game. I'm not going to buy in based on those games, but I am more open to him with what I've seen the past two games and what I've seen any time before this. So I'm I'm not I'm not there yet, but I'm yeah. open to it. So I mean I I don't like Allen. We we've talked about that. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not a believer. I, I understand that he does things with his legs, but like you have to throw the ball with accuracy in the NFL, at least more than we've seen from him. And uh I, I wanna I wanna reiterate that my statement is I will take Jared Goff and Sean McVay. Yeah over uh josh allen so um so i think when we're looking at this game the rams at the bills i think you got to kind of take a step back right so the man the rams made the super bowl in 2018 uh lost the patriots slipped to nine and seven last year in 2019 and didn't make the playoffs but you know the underlying metrics like the rams so they were ninth when you looked at my adjusted success rate on both offense and defense so that suggested that they could have been better and then, you know, they lost a lot of guys on the defense side of the ball. And I think we talked about that on uh, this program. They lost Dante Fowler, Marcus Peters, the cornerback, linebacker Corey Littleton. And, um, you know, we had our doubts on this show. Uh, I think we talked about whether McVeigh's, uh, you know, whether whether people have figured out Sean McVay and, and whether, you know, what was going to happen with that offense. <laughs> And, you know, when I looked at the Wisdom of Crowds model, when I do some of my preseason NFL stuff that I found to be predictive, like the Rams were as low as 19th. So they definitely uh, the sports writers were definitely saying that they didn't think the Rams were were that good. So now you come into the first season and, you know, th- this this yo-yoing of the lines on Rams games has happened in week one, too. Um, so I, Dallas was definitely a two and a half point favorite on the road at one point. I'm almost certain that I saw it go to the Rams being favored by at least one. It did. And then when, when I checked act- it, when inactives came out, it did. You're right. Yeah. And then when I checked it this morning, I, I basically take the median closing line from Don Best and it was, it was a push in, in the game. So, um, so the same thing that we saw last week, what you just talked about with, with Philadelphia, um, you know, in that first week, the Rams, they won. They won 20 to 17, and they held a pretty potent Dallas offense to 5.8 yards per pass attempt and uh, a, a 45% success rate on passing plays. And that's below the NFL average of 47% this year. So I just think, like, um, you know, you've seen glimmers that they're going to be decent on defense. I mentioned when we were talking to Teddy, I, I still like think that Buffalo's defense will probably grade out a little bit higher by season's end. And obviously injuries can definitely impact that. Um, again, we've, we've, we've beaten this dead horse that, that I <laughs> like Jared Goff and that Sean McVay on that offense. Uh, I do think this is really close. I think this is a very 50, 50 game, but, but definitely give me the points on this with, with the Rams on the road. I think for me, I want no part of this game, but it's not because of the Rams offense. I want no part of this game because I want more data on the Rams defense because We talk about how, like, we have priors going into the year, and, like, we have to react to what we see in the year and eventually divorce ourselves from our priors if we have reason to do so. My prior going in was that the Rams' defense was going to suck, and they haven't. Like you said, that Dallas game, 
was really good. I know that Dallas had uh, the injuries on the offensive line. I know Carson Wentz seems kind of broken right now, so you could d- discount that. But, like, it's very hard for me to ignore the the preseason conception I had of this defense that they were going to be really bad. Like, I, I got a bunch right. of Rams in my, my best ball contest for fantasy football because, like, I was like, okay, they're going to have to – they're going to be in a lot of shootouts. They're going to have to score points. Right. They're going to have to pass. So I like the offense, but the defense is very surprising to me. And, like, I don't know if I should divorce myself of that prior based on these two games. Like, it's very hard for me to just ignore, you know, they have two really good players defensively, but I'm really skeptical of it still. So, yeah. I, I well, like, I, I'm, just, I'm just confused about how to see that defense right now still. Sure. And it's interesting when I was talking to Dr. Eric Eager on my podcast, he was talking about how some of his work suggested like you shouldn't build a team around like defensive superstars. Like you'd rather be kind of solid across three or four players on the defensive line, solid across your your top three cover guys. Um, You know, we'll see how it shakes out with the Rams. You know, I mean, the the early returns on the defense is good. Again, this is a small sample size. And uh, yeah, we got a lot of football to play. Yeah, I'm excited to. I usually I'm not super excited to be in the Syracuse area because it means I get all the Buffalo games. I'm pretty excited to watch Sunday's game. I think this should be a good one. So uh, Ed has the Rams plus two and a half. We'll see how that one goes on Sunday. But I just want to watch that game and not have any personal sweat tied to it in any way. My cover in the future. We've got a lot of high totals on the board after the first two weeks, which makes sense because the point scoring has been nuts through the first two weeks. But I do want to hit an under here, and that's with the Patriots and the Raiders. That's at 47.5 with minus 110 on the under at FanDuel Sportsbook, and I'm expecting this game to go under. I do expect the Patriots to be efficient in this game. I think they're going to move the ball. I just don't expect there to be much play volume here, which is why I side with the under. That's because both teams tend to be super rush heavy. Through the first two games, the Patriots have the lowest pass rate in the league in the uh, first half and early downs. The Raiders are 28th. That is according to Sharp Football Stats. So it's two bottom five teams in pass rate. The Patriots especially are like hyper efficient with those rushes. So it's totally okay that they do this with, with the way the can's running, with the way their offense in general is going. So I expect them to move the ball, but when you run... It keeps the clock rolling, and that plays well for unders. The Patriots rank 23rd in situation-neutral pace. That's according to Football Outsiders. The Raiders are 22nd, and I'd expect the Patriots' defense to play a whole heck heck of a lot better at home against Derek Carr than they did on the road against Russell Wilson. 60% of the money here is on the under. That's according to Oddsfire, so I would expect this one to come down even a bit more before Sunday. It was 48 originally. It's now 47 and a half, so I think that it may come down more. So I would try to get this one uh, while you can. I try to get it, uh, and I do think that uh, if you think the under is in play, I would bet that now rather than waiting. In general, I have been skewing towards overs this year. Overs have been very kind to me, but in this specific game with how much these two teams love to run, I think the total has gone up just a bit more than it should. So give me the under on 47 and a half for the Patriots against the Raiders. Ed, we were talking about Cam Newton and uh, getting good read on him on Sunday. I do not expect to get a good read on him in this game because I think they're going to run a lot. And I think the Raiders defense stinks. So I don't think we'll learn a whole lot more about this Patriots offense in week number three, unfortunately. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we learned a lot about the Raiders offense on Monday night, though. Yeah, that's true. Because they were very good against the New Orleans defense that we thought uh, was not going to be – sorry, a New Orleans defense that we thought was going to be pretty good, like yeah. a Super Bowl-worthy type defense. Um, so they had a 58% success rate on passing plays, 59, 58.5. And, uh, you know, maybe that shouldn't be a surprise because when I look at adjusted success, success rate on pass plays last year, uh, you know, the same team was fourth in the yeah. NFL. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of keep, I, w- I was surprised with what I saw, uh, Monday night and, um, you know, I don't think, you know, no one seems to kind of acknowledge that Derek Carr is, is maybe a good quarterback, but I, I, you know, I think with what he's done, you know, with this short passing game, uh, with what he's done under Gruden, you know, his numbers look pretty good. You know, his bad ball numbers that, that I've been tracking, uh, look pretty good as well in terms of, you know, reducing interceptions. So, yeah, so it, it'll be – it's definitely a game I'm, I'm looking at. And 
we were talking about we talked about their passing success earlier, like in the offseason, and we expected that to either stay steady or get better just because Henry Ruggs uh, is good uh, at football. Right. That definitely helps things. They added Brian Edwards. They added some other, like, uh, role player type guys like Zay Jones, Nelson Aguilar. Like, that can help, too. Another year, Josh Jacobs potentially getting work in the passing game. Uh, intriguing, too. So I, I'm not as low on the Raiders' offense as everyone. I just think the Patriots' defense is good, and I think this game is going right. to be – pretty low scoring if if the two teams have played the game they want to which is running the ball a lot i think we'll see an under here but overall i'm pretty pumped about this week three slate between seahawks cowboys again i think bills rams is pretty fun that might just be me as like a jared goff truther um and then of course we have chiefs ravens this is gonna be a fun week of football ed yeah i think every week is fun i mean Is, I mean, when, when you have a league that is built on regression to the mean, you're going to get a lot of close, exciting games. I mean, Jacksonville is a favorite. <laughs> I mean, this was definitively the worst team in the NFL going yeah. into the season. And they are favored on Thursday night. That that's, game will be fun, too. That's kind of fun just in and of itself. Yeah, that, that'll be fun. I mean, like, again, I'm slow to buy into Gardner Minshew, but, like, you know, he's fun. Like, it's kind of yeah. like the Josh Allen thing. Like, I can be skeptical, but still enjoy watching them play because they are erratic and fun. And like Gardner Minshew's not erratic; he's more he's more the Derek Carr type, where he keeps things pretty tight to the line of scrimmage. But that can be fun to watch too if, uh, if there's a little bit extra swag to it. So uh, should be a fun slate of football. Looking forward to diving on in. That is all that we ha- have for this week here on covering the spread. But as mentioned, make sure you are subscribed because. Minus some extra treats coming your way next week. So make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Ed, what's going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Uh, what's going on? I'm, I'm writing newsletters. I'm writing content for uh, for members. Um, so, yeah, please sign up for my free email newsletter. Uh, get a sample of my best predictions, usually saved for paying members of the site. And then uh, also I've, uh, I have I got um, my Covering the Future up to my members a little bit earlier nice uh this week so i'm gonna try to do that every week because there's really no reason not to unless i'm just disorganized so um (laughs) you know members of my site get access to all my stuff and uh the powerrank.net is a url that'll take you to a place where you can check that out all right the powerrank.net makes you check out the football analytics show as well to get all of ed's thoughts in audio form uh and also follow ed on twitter at the power rank i am at jim sonnes j-i-m-s-a-n-n-e-s you can also follow the fanduel podcast network at fanduel podcast big thank you to teddy zivransky for swinging by and breaking down week number three give teddy a follow on twitter at teddy underscore covers thank you to calvin theobald our video producer from the video side of things here today thank you cal as always And of course, thank you to all of you for tuning in once again for week number three. Good luck with all of your bets. Enjoy the fun football. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.